We're going to be starting on um, page 339 in Devil Worship, the Shocking Facts. Actually, um, before I get started, I'm thinking of a scripture. I'd like to read a couple of scriptures before we get started here. Let me start with Hosea 6, chapter 6, verse 4. Okay, here we go. Excuse me, 4, verse 6. It says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you, that you will be no priest to me. Because you have forgotten the law of Yahweh, I also, or I will also forget your children. Okay? And I want to read that one more time, just part of it. It says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And then it says, because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you, that you will be no priest to me. So what we're going to be covering tonight in this book here, Devil Worship the Shocking Facts, we're going to be looking at how people worship the gods, how they, a lot of them unknowingly give honor and glory to the gods. You know, some people just don't know who Yahweh is, you know, and the main reason for that is because they haven't been taught. But now there's no excuse because the house of Yahweh has been established in these last days, bringing forth the information that's necessary for salvation. But people are also rejecting this information that's coming from Yahweh's house. So let's start on page 338, actually, on page 338. We haven't had class for a while. Look at uh, page 336. In the middle of that page, there it says, showing honor to the god demons, luck, and fate. And so we're picking up where the great Kahan left off back in March. At the top of page 338, it says, however, in Collier's Encyclopedia, on volume 10, Page 209, it goes on to tell us in no uncertain terms that the, this goddess who acted capriciously or impulsively was the goddess of chance or luck. And as we have already read in Isaiah 65, 11, Yahweh vigorously condemned this worship. So let's, let's look at Isaiah 65, 11 again just to refresh our memories. Isaiah 65, 11. I don't have any bookmarks to the, this evening. <laughs> 6511. It says, But you are those who forsook Yahweh, or forsake Yahweh, who forget my holy mountain, who prepare a table for that troop and furnish a drink offering for that number. So it's talking about God worshiping, worshiping these deities, these demons. You know, remember what the uh, what the apostle Shaul wrote. He said that um, and what the Gentiles sacrificed, they sacrificed to demons and not to Yahweh. And Moshe actually wrote about that also in, uh, in Deuteronomy, showing what the people in the surrounding lands were doing, how they were serving their gods. And Yahweh said, do not worship me the way that they worship their gods. These things are forbidden. And here we see this, this worship here of Fortuna. And the, uh, the underlying part says a goddess of chance or luck. Okay, a goddess of chance or luck. Fortune telling and divination is worship. It is sin. It is service to those demons or these demon gods and goddesses. But what is so amazing is the fact that this world gives honor to these gods and goddesses almost every day just through the words they, uh, they thoughtlessly speak. The following definitions will be from Webster's uh, Deluxe Underbridge Dictionary by Simon and Shuster. New York, 1979. In reading the defini definition of Fortuna, we find that she is the goddess of fortune. And you can see that underlined right there next to the name. Have you ever heard anyone say, fortunately, so and so took place? Okay, fortunately, so and so took place. Then this is giving honor to the goddess fortune and in fact shows admiration which is one form of worship to this demon. Then the definition of fortune tells us that chance, hap, fate, or fortune are all personified, which means to think or speak of these things as having life or personality. And you can see these underlying words here, chance, hap, fate, fortune. 
It says here, number one, a fictitious power regarded as bestowing good or evil upon people. Luck, chance, fate, often personified. But did you notice that second word there after the, the number one? Fictitious. <laughs> it's a fictitious power. Okay, a fictitious power regarded as bestowing good and evil upon people. Okay? Fictitious. It says, through fortune's malice, though fortune's malice overthrew my state, it says, the good or evil that is going to happen to one, one's lot, good or bad, especially one's fortune or future lot, good luck. It says, the words good luck, as heard regularly among the unconverted, who never realize that these are honoring these gods, goddesses, and demons. Therefore, Fortuna, or Fortuna, is the goddess of chance, of hap, of fate, and of fortune, which means that she is also the goddess of luck. Because this is the definition of chance, hap, fate, and fortune, as we will see. And pay close attention to uh, these, these definitions here, because we're going to tie all of these things here in a second. Okay, chance. It says, apparently, apparent absence or cause or design, okay, apparent absence of cause or design, destiny, fortune, often personified as chance, uh, a happening, fortuitous event, an accident, hap, chance, that which comes suddenly or unexpectedly, fate, the power supposed to determine the outcome of events before they occur, hence inevitable Necessity, destiny, depending on a superior cause, and uncontrollable, okay? Uncontrollable. As according to the uh, Stoics, every event is determined by fate, okay? Uncontrolled. Every, all of this is uncontrolled, and it's controlled. Everything is controlled by fate. You know, it's, it's just it's, it's, it's foolishness when you start breaking down these words and how people just throw themselves out and live a life hoping that everything's gonna work out just fine, okay? It's like swimming with sharks. <laughs> Luck, the, seeming, the seemingly chance happening of events which affect one future lot fate. Okay, so here what all of these things have in common is that basically there, there's events that take place that has, it's not by design. Like the first one here was chance. It says apparent absence or, of cause or design. So it's absent of a cause. Or, there's no plan. Okay, there's no plan. It's just, it's an accident. Whatever occurs, is, it's, it's, it's destiny. It's fate. It was supposed to take place like that. That's what people believe. But that's not the way of Yahweh. Yahweh has a plan. It's designed to do certain things. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of scriptures here. Uh, first, let's, <laughs> let's take a look at uh, Yachanan. Okay, Yachanan chapter 1. And these are familiar scriptures. Okay, so it doesn't take much to, you know, to disprove the, the brilliant people of the world, you know, when you have Yahweh, when you know the teachings of Yahweh. It says, in the beginning was the plan of Yahweh, and the plan was with Yahweh, and the plan was Yahweh's. The same plan was in the beginning with Yahweh. All things that were done according to it, and without it, nothing was done that was done. So nothing just occurs by accident. Okay, nothing occurs by accident. Nothing occurs just by chance. You know, remember, one of the uh, prophets was inspired to write, you know, you change times and seasons to yield a specific event. You change time and seasons to bring forth your will. You know, Yahweh is in complete control of his plan. You know, it's not by chance or, you know, or destiny or fate, which the world believes in. No, Yahweh has a specific plan, and there's things that we need to do in order to be a part of that plan. Okay, it's, a, it's by design. There's other scriptures, but I don't really want to get off into, off the subject here. But that should be enough to, to get you to, to see, you know, or to go through the scriptures and see how Yahweh has planned these things out. Um, Let's continue on here. It says here that the powers behind the worship of these personified gods are the demons. But not only this, if you, if you wish anyone a happy birthday, 
you are wishing this hidden god demon of good luck who was known in Rome as Fortuna to capriciously to capriciously on a whim to bestow good upon someone the definition of happy is good good luck chance luck fortunate favored by circumstances okay favored by circumstances okay so in the house of Yahweh, do we, do we believe that, well, by saying good luck, we're going to have, like, maybe some blessings? <laughs> no, not at all. Deuteronomy 28, uh, it tells you what you should do if you want to receive blessings from Yahweh, if you, want to, if you want your crops to grow, if you want your children to be healthy, if you want to be healthy. All of these things come from you doing certain things, namely keeping the laws of Yahweh, Okay. You can't tell someone good luck and then let them go in the house and then hopefully the grass is green, they have fruit trees and so on and so forth. No, people have to be taught what to do in order to receive the blessings from Father Yahweh. There's work that needs to be done in order to have these great blessings. You know, if you want peace, you know, you have to work at it. There's rules that need to be kept in order for there to be peace. You know, the world says good luck to each other all the time. You know, they uh, like in sports competitions, you know. Both teams, they say good luck to each other. Who's going to win that game? The one who has the most luck? <laughs> I'm going to turn around and throw the ball this way. Watch it go in. It's ridiculous. You know, but these are just customs and things that people learn, and they just continue to practice it because they are uneducated. Okay? They don't have the truth. They don't have this knowledge of Yahweh that would actually allow them to have real value in life. Okay? Or to truly value life, I should say and to truly appreciate the, the great design that Yahweh has done, or the things that he's created so that we can actually enjoy life. You know, it's a lack of knowledge. And that's really what I want to stress this day. You know, and that's why I started off reading Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, because it's a lack of knowledge that actually allows us to allow death to enter into our lives. You know, if we're educated in the way of Yahweh, then we know what to stay away from. We know how to make right choices so that we can allow Yahweh to have this perfect work in our life. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking of another scripture. I think it's Isaiah 55. Okay, Isaiah 55. And I need to just back up a little bit. Well, let me just read this here. Isaiah 55 verse 11 says, My word, the law and the prophet that goes forth from my mouth, my word will not return to me void without producing effect, but it will accomplish that which I please, and it will succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Okay? And the reason that I read that is because earlier, you know, and up until now we were talking about um, this knowledge of Yahweh and how the people don't know Yahweh and they reject this knowledge. But Yahweh has given us his words, these inspired words, to produce within us certain things, namely his character. Okay, so that we can actually have peace, joy, and abundant living and to have the, uh, the blessing of living forever. But the world that rejects these teachings, they're not going to be able to, you know, receive these great blessings like we're receiving right now. Okay? They're going to one day. They're going to one day, but we're the ones that's learning these things first. Okay? And it's been given to us to know these things, as Yeshua said. It's not given to everyone. They hear it. But they just don't understand, you know, and I want to remind you of how thankful we should be to Father Yahweh that we actually can hear pastor and understand what he's saying. OK, because not everyone who hears him understands that they need to be obedient to the, every word that comes out of his mouth. Not everyone understands that, but everyone that's listening, we understand these things. And because we're listening and we understand, we're blessed because of it. How blessed are we? We'll find out. Okay, we'll find out just how blessed we are, but if we continue to be obedient, continuing to grow in this great knowledge, we're going to be blessed forever. I mean, just having life alone is a blessing. Okay? Just having life alone is a blessing. How many people here wake up in the morning and they don't feel any pain at all? No stiff muscles, you know, no stiffness in the neck. I don't see not one hand. So someone, So everyone's hurting every day a little bit? Yeah, it's not always going to be like that. Can't even imagine that, can you? <laughs> it seems so small, but imagine waking up every day just jumping out of bed like when you were like 10 years old or something. 
full of energy, just running around, you know, can't even go to sleep. You know, even though your parents trying to make you go to sleep, oh, I'm not tired. Oh, you better go to sleep. <laughs> you know, we're going to have that kind of energy again. We're going to be so filled with energy. We're going to be so healthy that we can't even imagine it right now. We're so riddled with pain. <laughs> but it's something to look forward to. And that's really small, but it's big. Okay, it's a small thing compared to the, uh, the blessings that Yahweh wants to give us. You know, but if we just keep these simple laws that Yahweh has given us, we will have health. We will have these blessings that he says that we will have. Um, continue reading here towards the bottom of page 339. It says, those who are wishing anyone a happy birthday are in accordance to an established ancient pattern using a formula of, pro pro how do you say that, pro- Man, everybody can say that but me. <laughs> One more time, please. Pro. Pro. Hey, I guess I'm more oaky than everyone in here, and I'm pro really pleased to say that. Propitiation. All right. <laughs> Praise Yahweh. All right. So the meaning of that word is it says uh, to cause to become favorably inclined, to win or regain the goodwill of or to appease or conci uh, conciliate. Okay, so again, we could just go right back to Deuteronomy 28. Okay, it's not about, you know, hoping to gain favor with, but through obedience to the laws of Yahweh, that's how we're going to receive blessings. You know, this is how Yahweh is allowed, he's able to call us his sons through obedience. You know, not children of disobedience to where we leave Yahweh and say, you know, I'm going to go out here, we had cakes and we have money we had all of this before we came to your house i'm going back to egypt where we have pots of meat you know that was the attitude okay no our obedience to yahweh will allow the earth to be completely cleansed and healed to the point where we can have everything that we want okay everything that we want but as long as there's lawlessness and sin you know there's going to be death but as the scriptures show us that the, uh, the last enemy that's going to be destroyed is death itself, okay? And again, that means that there will be no more sin. The house of Yahweh is established, and let's, let's read that this in Isaiah 2, too. Turn right to it. Let's see here. I want to read verse 4. And you know Isaiah 2, too, the, the house of Yahweh was established. So verse 4 says, He will judge among the nations and will rebuke many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn war any more. Okay? That's because of the house of Yahweh in these last days, teaching righteousness, teaching people how to get along with one another, okay? teaching people the value of life. Okay? This is why they will learn war no more. And this is why we're going to uh, put an end to death itself. Continuing on here, the top of page 340. In other words... By wishing someone a happy birthday, they are asking the hidden gods and goddesses to turn their wrath away from that person. In reading from the New International Dictionary of the Christian Church, we find this information on propitiation. <laughs> this word is the correlative of wrath and can only be understood with reference to it. In theology, it applies to the turning aside of divine wrath against sinful man. It is uncon uncongenial to much modern thought. It is thought pagan. Okay, it's pagan to, 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 uh, to call upon the gods and to ask them, no, don't be mad at this person. Happy birthday. I hope the God's not mad at you. <laughs> Good luck. When someone wishes another happy birthday, he or she is praying to the hidden God, hoping that the fickle, whimsical gods and the goddesses of luck, fate, and fortune will bestow good upon them. Therefore, do not wish anyone a happy birthday. Do not wish, do not wish them a happy anything, for that matter. And above all, do not accept from anyone a happy birthday nor any other greeting in honor of the demon gods and goddesses that inspired, excuse me, the demon gods and goddesses. The inspired words of King David tell us in Psalm 16, 4, that their sorrows are multiplied who seek after gods. We offer not their blood gift. We do not say their names, okay? Their sorrows are multiplied, you know? And this is almost, 
it's, it's like a prophecy. You know, remember in Revelations it says that, you know, the, um, their sins are going to reach into heaven. Okay? How is it going to do that? You know, sorrow upon sorrow, sin upon sin, new God created upon new God, until there's no room for them on the earth that they have to actually venture out into the heavens. Okay? They're all over the place. The air, you know, or the firmament, the water, the land, the animal, the people. The earth is defiled. The entire earth. That's including the inhabitants. You know, mankind. All of us. Why? Because sorrows are multiplied who seek after the gods. Our sorrows have been multiplied. And the only reason that we broke away from this is because we accepted our calling. We heard the great witness in these last days teaching, and we say, hey, that makes sense. The seventh day? Huh. Yahweh? Oh, what is that? Yahweh? What is that? I've never heard that before. And next thing you know, we're keeping the feast. <laughs> Meeting people from all over the world who wants to keep Yahweh's laws and put aside the hatred that we've been taught all of our lives towards one another. Okay? We've learned that here at Yahweh's house because of his great plan that was controlled, his controlled plan. Okay? Not uncontrolled, not by accident, but a plan from the very beginning to bring peace to mankind, to bring peace to all of creation. You know, we're just the first ones that's accepting this opportunity to, uh, to live in peace. It says, a greeting in the honor, a greeting in honor of Yahweh. This is from Unger, Unger's Bible Dictionary. It says, pure Yahwism is basically a variant with divination of every sort. Seeking knowledge of the future from any other source than the God of Israel was an insult to his holy being and the revelation of him and his purpose for men. And you can see how they throw words in there that sound holy, like, like divination. We already know that, you know, divination has nothing to do with Yahweh, okay? We already know that. So let's uh, actually, Isaiah seems to be a popular book this night. Isaiah, what is it, 44. Isaiah 44. Because people are always seeking to know the future. And here in verse... Six, this is what Yahweh, the king of Israel and redeemer, Yahweh of hosts says, I am the first and I am the last, except for me there is no source of power. Okay, there is no source of power, none. Okay, but who are they seeking? Fate, uh, Fortuna, and all these other gods, hoping for blessings, hoping for, for some gift. But Yahweh says there is no source of power. And who, as I, will foretell and set in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things which are coming and will come, let them foretell them. Okay, he's saying, who can, who's going to tell you the future? There's no one that can tell you the future except the ones that I appoint to tell you the future, because no one knows the future but me. Okay, and so who did he say was going to tell you the things that were going to come in the future? Israel, Israel Hawkins, our pastor, right? He says, let them foretell them, the two witnesses. Did he say go to uh, Cleo's, like, Magic 8-Ball Club or something? <laughs> Who is Cleo? <laughs> You're looking into a little fortune ball and or reading your palms and trying to tell you, oh, that's a long line right there. That means you're going to have long life. That'll be $20, please. It's a money-making money scheme. You know, that's what it is. You know, and how does knowing you're going to have a long life, how is that going to get you into the kingdom if you're going to live a long life of sin? So that didn't, that didn't help you much, okay? So anything worth knowing is here at Yahweh's house, okay? Anything worth knowing is right here at Yahweh's house. Everything else, you know, doesn't lead you to salvation, okay? And that's what we're after here. We're after eternal life, a place in, uh, in Yahweh's kingdom forever, okay? And there's rules that govern that, and you're not going to get that from any church, okay? You're not going to get the rules to Yahweh's kingdom at any church, only here at his house, so continuing on here, it says, as this source reference actually says, just like the Apostle Shaul said in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 20 through 22, the things with the, which the Gentiles sacrifice, and it says, including the sacrifices of good wishes, they sacrifice to demons and not to Yahweh. We simply cannot have fellowship with demons and at the same time have fellowship with Yahweh. Yahweh will not tolerate it. Fellowship means participation. And if you have fellowship with any of this Satan-inspired devil worship, then you are committing sin. The scriptures then tell us in black and white that if we participate in this sin, 
Yahweh simply will have no participation with us. In Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, we read, Behold, Yahweh's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your own iniquities, the breaking of Yahweh's laws, have separated you from your father. And your own sins, the breaking of Yahweh's law, have caused him to hide his face from you, so he will not listen. And there's a proverb, I can't remember exactly how it's written, but it says uh, something, what does it say? I think if a, a man has something to do with um, even your prayers are an abomination. Thank you. He who turns his ear away from hearing the laws of Yahweh, even his prayers are an abomination. Okay. Well, I'm, Proverbs 28. I want to read it because I didn't remember it offhand. So that means uh, it's slipping into the backgrounds. Psalm, uh, Proverbs 28. Twenty-eight, verse nine: He who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayers, are an abomination. Well, that's pretty much word for word. <laughs> okay, so you know the bottom. Let me read the footnote here too. It says, "Because they are not of the faith, which is grounded on the law and the prophets, which the wicked condemns." So it's just like uh, like we just read in Isaiah fifty-nine one and two. You know, if you're if you're breaking Yahweh's law then how are you going to ask Yahweh for anything? How are you going to petition Yahweh, request anything from him? You know, you're out here, let's, let's just say you're murdering, committing fornication and adultery, and you're stealing. You know, Father, I pray that you will give me the strength. that I'm... Strength for what? <laughs> what, do you, what do you hope to accomplish by praying to Yahweh when you're breaking his laws? You think he's going to listen to you? No, he's not, Okay. And the house of Yahweh was established so that we can realize that, oh, that was wrong. Okay, Father Yahweh, give me the strength to overcome these things that I once partook in because I didn't know that these things was wrong because these religious, of the, religious leaders of the world didn't tell me that I was wrong. You know, that's why Yahweh says in, uh, in Eremia chapter 23, woe to you pastors. Woe to you pastors. I'm going to attend to you because you did not attend to my flock. You scattered my people abroad and you did not teach them righteousness. Okay. So I'm going to deal with you for what you have done. Okay, so we cannot fall into that same category because we're commissioned in these last days to learn the way of Yahweh and then to teach what we've learned. Or we're going to be in the same situation as these pastors in uh, Eremia chapter 23. The same situation, except it's going to be worse on us because we know better. Okay, we've been called to Yahweh's house. We've, we're able to see the difference between the God worship and the worship of Yahweh. We see that God worships lead to death and the ways of Yahweh leads to life. And so if we don't do our jobs in these last days, you think that Yahweh's going to really be merciful to us? You know, and he's a merciful father. But if we don't do our jobs, I mean, what do you what do you think? Remember, it was it was written. It's a fearful thing to fall into what? It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living Father. And that's not to, like, strike fear in us. You know, we're supposed to reverence Yahweh with joy and thanksgiving. But it, the scriptures also says, cursed is he who does Yahweh's work without what? Diligence. diligence. Cursed is he who does Yahweh's work without diligence. So Yahweh expects a lot of us. Okay, we're the first fruits. So, you know, <laughs> we better get busy. All right, y'all know I lost my place, right? <laughs> Where am I at here? Let's see. I'm on page 348. That's not the right page. I got a little excited up here and lost my page. 341? Oh, yeah, okay. Here I am. Okay, the scriptures also tell us that there is a day coming when these gods and goddesses, demons, will be destroyed. And their names will no longer be remembered as we read in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 2. In that day, says Yahweh of hosts, I will cut off the names of the gods from the land, and they will be remembered no longer. I will also cause the false prophets and the unclean spirit, demonism, Satan worship, to depart from the land. Eremia 10, verse, well, when we read, I don't want to just pass this up because Yahweh says this is what I'm going to do. 
You know, I'm going to remove all of these things from the land. But how is he doing that? How is he going to do that? Right through the teachings. Yahweh works through his people. You know, it's going to be us out here teaching the laws of Yahweh and, and teaching people not to partake in these things anymore. It's not like Yahweh's just going to show up. Bam. That's it. No, he's not doing that. Or else he would have been done that. He doesn't want to do that. He wants us to, to partake in this joy of teaching. Teaching is a joy. You know, it's a great joy to share with someone and then to watch them grow and to have peace and joy because of something that you share with them because of something that you learn from someone else. You know, it's a pattern. You know, teach what you learn, then you teach what you learn from generation to generation. And then to watch people, you know, to watch your children grow up to be, you know, responsible adults, you know, doing everything that you taught them to do. There's a great joy in that. And Yahweh wants us to partake in that joy. You know, his great joy is in Yahshua, our Messiah, our high priest. You know, his joy is in our pastor. You know, Father Yahweh has great joy in a lot of the men and women of old that we read about in the scriptures because of the choices that they made, you know, based on how they were taught. You know, and we can all be a part of that, you know, learning and teaching, learning and teaching, learning and teaching throughout all of eternity. You know, do we think we're ever going to learn or know as much as Yahweh? <laughs> You know, we'll be blessed if we can somewhat even try to catch up the pastor, you know, but it's fun learning. I remember um, uh, a couple of feasts ago, I remember when pastor said, I want you to study out and try to find the name of that woman. You know, how many people actually try to search for that woman's name? You know, I had fun searching for it. I learned a lot of different things about the region where she was living in and things like that, trying to figure out, figure out what her name was. Didn't figure out the name, but I had fun studying it out, you know, just researching. You know, it was, it was fun. But then it took Pastor saying, Nora. No, oh, yeah, I still can't find that anywhere. <laughs> I believe the witness because I'm like, well, I don't. And he gave us the meaning of the name. You know, I forgot what he said. The meaning was something about the donkeys or um, crying out or something like that. I can't remember, and I'm sorry about that. But the point is, you know, when you study and you search these things out, you know, it brings great joy, you know, and now, you know, we're, we're, we're singing Nora's name, you know, in the, in the song, and that's something that's going to be done forever, and we're going to be teaching people the things that we learn here, and it's, oh, that was her name, it's not in the script, yeah, that's her name, Nora, you know, and that's just one thing that we've learned in Yahweh's great house. There's no telling how many things we really learned here, you know, how much have we forgotten? Well, get that Yisrael says, and it'll remind you of how much you've forgotten, <laughs> Continuing on here, it says, uh, I keep looking on the wrong page. Jeremiah 10, verse 11. This is what you will say to them. These gods which, you have, which have not made the heavens and the earth. Let me start over. This is what you will say to them. These gods which have not made the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under these heavens. Okay, because they're trying to steal all of this glory from Yahweh. You know, they haven't created one thing. Okay, not one thing. In this same day, we also find that Yahweh himself will no longer be referred to by these names, nor will they ever be mentioned again. In Hosea 2, verses 16 through 17, we find, And it will be in that day, says Yahweh, that you will call me Ishi, my husband, and, no long, and will no longer call me Baali, my lord. For I will take away the names of Baalim, Lords, gods, goddesses, demons out of her mouth, and their names will no longer be called upon. Yes, in that day, Yahweh will restore the pure word and a purified language to the peoples, as if we read in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9. Yes, at that time, I will return to the peoples the pure word so that all of them may call upon the name of Yahweh and serve him with one accord or in unity. Okay, so this is one of the things that we have to look forward to. Okay, everyone serving Yahweh. Okay, everyone, every man, woman, and child, every business, every governmental system that's established in every city, state, nation, everyone will be serving Yahweh. Okay, everyone keeping the Sabbath day, everyone coming together to keep the feast of Yahweh. Okay. Not mentioning hinder gods, not coming to the feast and trying to beat spots and blemishes on the feast, starting trouble, you know, trying to be House of Yahweh gangsters. <laughs> There's no House of Yahweh gangsters, I'm telling you. 
you know, nor will there ever will be. Okay, everyone will be coming here to rejoice in the fact that, you know, we know one another, we know the laws of Yahweh, we know how to act towards one another, and it's, and it's, a, it's a joy to keep the feast and there's no confusion. You know, if anyone has grown up in an area where there's, you know, violence, you know, you know, like, uh, like in New York, like in uh, all these other countries, you know. Imagine living in Israel, where if you walk down the street, uh, a, a car bomb can go off, or a bakery can, can blow up. You know, just walking down the street, that could be your last moments in life. You know, imagine living like that. You know, imagine how much joy and peace you will have knowing that you don't have to worry about those kinds of things anymore. You don't have to worry about people sending rockets into your schools. You don't have to worry about, you know, people kidnapping your children. You don't have to worry about, you know, your heads getting cut off and things like that. Imagine the joy you'll have knowing that, hey, now we truly have peace and safety because we all agree on the laws of Yahweh and we're all keeping the laws of Yahweh. This comes, um, this is a part of the promise of this pure word, this, uh, this, this, these pure teachings coming forth from the house of Yahweh. Because these teachings are the pure word of Yahweh, this pure language. You know, remember what, remember what Yeshua said? He said, do you know why you don't understand my language? Was he, was he speaking Spanish? <laughs> no, they didn't understand his language. He said, because you reject the law and the prophets. Okay, you reject the law and the prophets. That's why you don't understand what I'm saying. If you will accept, if you will believe in the laws and the prophecies, then you will understand that when I say to you, you need to keep the Sabbath. All right, it's December. Let's put that tree up. Up, oh, it's April. Let's get those eggs and that dye. Up, oh, it's March. Get the green dye. Let's throw it in the water. You know, you're going to be continuing in these, these customs because you reject the law and the prophets. And guess what? Drunkenness, murder, rape, theft, so on and so forth because you reject the law and the prophets. Continuing on here, it says that the the pure word will be the every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yahweh, purified from the defilement of gods, goddesses, Baal, El, Elohim, the defilement of Satan, the devil, which are called upon by this whole deceived world in this day and age. Yahweh himself commands us in Exodus 23, verse 13. It says, in all things I have said to you, be careful to do them and make no mention of the name of hindered gods neither let it be heard from your mouth. But another scriptural fact remains. Those who are striving to serve Yahweh at this time have already started the process of purifying their language. They are now removing the names of these gods from their vocabularies. They are now deleting anything from their speech which gives honor to the gods. They are now striving to make no mention of the names of hindered gods. They are now endeavoring to abolish gods and goddesses' names from their mouth, hap, luck, fate, and fortune, along with any derivatives of them, including the word happy. Okay, so again, part of this pure word, part of this pure teaching is removing the, the, the names of these gods and the, the hidden worship, the hidden, uh, uh, what's the word, the hidden, uh, wor well, the hidden worship that comes behind them. Okay, again, like we just saw, wishing someone a happy birthday is actually, you know, praying that the gods or goddesses would turn their wrath away from that person. I mean, who knew that? You know, Yahweh's last days anointed witness. Okay, and he taught it to us. Now it's going to be our jobs to teach it to someone else. But first we have to practice these things. We have to learn them, then teach them. Yes, Yahweh is now renewing his covenant with us by putting his laws in our hearts at this very time. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16, we find... This is the covenant which I will renew with them after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Now, understanding that these words are used in honor of the gods, what words should we use to replace this pagan word happy? And here it says happiness, but down at the bottom it says blessed. And the preferred translation in the New Testament is blessed. Okay, so we shouldn't be using happy says, yes, we should use the word blessed. However, there is a special way even in this word. There is a special way even this word should be used when it is used in honor of Yahweh. We have found from the scriptures that there is nothing wrong with recording one's birthday. 
We have also found that there is nothing wrong with recognizing one's birthday, nor the length of years a person has lived. Now, Yahweh reveals how one birth, one's birthday should be recognized. In Colossians 3, verse 17, we are given this command. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Yahshua Messiah, giving thanks to Yahweh our Father through him. And as we have been commanded in no uncertain terms, whatever we do in speech or deeds, do each and everything in the name of or by the authority of Yahshua Messiah, giving thanks to Yahweh our Father through Yahshua Messiah. So therefore, acknowledging someone's date of birth according to this outline, may Yahweh be blessed, praised, thanked through Yahshua Messiah for allowing you to come to this day. And if you will not... And if you not bless Yahweh in their greeting, in your word or deed, giving blessings, praise, thanks and all honor to Yahweh, our Father, through Yahshua Messiah, our high priest, then simply do not accept them nor their greeting. This is an abomination. Therefore, if you do not accept this, then we know that Yahweh will not accept you. Now, accepting gifts to Yahweh's honor. The whole world today picks two or three days each year to try to show that they care for a child or a grandchild by giving them gifts. In selecting these days on which to bestow these gifts, they usually have, a, they have no thought or question about what is actually behind these days nor behind the meaning of these gifts. And so again, this is a just blind traditions, you know, people just blindly doing the things that they were taught to do. Okay, giving gifts. What's behind these gifts? What's behind this day? What's behind this saying that you use on this particular day? However, let's see, when this world celebrates a birthday, honor is actually being given to a pagan hidden gods, given to pagan hidden gods for having allowed this person to be so lucky to live for so many years. However, all honor should be given to Yahweh, who alone can bestow life and who alone decides who will be given the free gift of eternal life. The one sure way to honor Yahweh is by doing what he tells us to do. If we honor Yahweh by doing this, we will be obeying every word that proceeds from his mouth, just as he has commanded. In Leviticus chapter 23, we find the words which Yahweh has spoken, commanding us to keep his feasts. In Leviticus 22, verses 1 and 2, we read, and Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, Concerning the feast of Yahweh, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are, and what does it say there? My feasts. My feasts. Okay, these are my feasts, says Yahweh. For those who might mistake, mistakenly think that this law was for, that this law was not written for them, we find these laws were written for instruction which say, Exodus 12, 49, one law shall be for the native born and for the stranger who dwells among you. In Numbers 15, 16, one law and one manner shall be for you and for the stranger who sojourns among you. Yahweh has listed his feasts in Leviticus chapter 23. And contrary to popular uh, Christian teachings, these are not feasts of Moses, neither are they the feasts of the Jews. Emphatically, Yahweh himself has said in Leviticus chapter 22, 3, that these are my feasts. These belong to Yahweh. They're Yahweh's feasts. And remember, we're invited to keep Yahweh's feasts, right? Yahweh invites us to his house. He's called us to his house to keep the feast with him. Okay, he says, come here, come to my house and learn what it is that you should do. Okay, come to my house. Okay, forget <laughs> Forget those traveling feasts, okay? Traveling all over the U.S. trying to keep a feast. Yahweh is not there, okay? Yahweh is at his house where he placed his name, established by his two witnesses, just like he said, okay? Nothing is done outside of the plan of Yahweh, okay? Nothing is done outside of that which he said is going to be done. It's not an accident. It's not destiny. It's not fate. It's a great plan by our Heavenly Father, the feasts which Yahweh lists in this chapter for his people to observe and do are Yahweh's weekly Sabbath day, 
Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath day of Yahweh in all your dwellings. And our understanding has increased since this book. So we already know that, you know, the work that we do is the work of Yahweh. Okay, serving one another, having an attitude of servitude. Okay, that's what Yahweh teaches us to do on the Sabbath day. Okay, but I can't go home and mow my lawn. Okay, I can't do that kind of work. No, but I can come here and serve you. Okay, that's what Yahweh has given us. Praise Yahweh. As we can read in these scriptures, in this scripture, each and every weekly Saturday, seventh day Sabbath is a feast in honor of Yahweh. Reading in Leviticus 23, verse 4, we find that there are feasts to Yahweh which are to be celebrated in their seasons, which are the appointed times Yahweh ordains within his sacred year and are Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. On the 14th day, excuse me, on the 14th of the first moon between the two evenings, Yahweh's Passover sacrifice is to be killed. And on the 15th day of the same moon is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to Yahweh. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no regular work on it, but you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh for seven days. The seventh day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no regular work on it. Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. And you shall count for yourself from the day after the first Holy day Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven full weeks shall be completed. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh week. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to Yahweh. And you shall proclaim on that same day that it may be a holy convocation to you. You shall do no regular work on it. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. Feast of Tabernacles and the Last Great Day. Then Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. Now, we do understand that when he says, Speak to the children of Israel, he's not saying just have a casual conversation, right? What is he saying? Exactly. Teach the children of Israel. Okay? Teach them. It says, The fifteenth day of the seventh moon in the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto Yahweh. On the first day, there shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no regular work on it. But for seven days, you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh. On the eighth day, you shall have a holy convocation, the last great day, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh. It is the closing gathering of Yahweh's sacred year, and you shall do no customary regular work on it. In a broad sense, the term feast can be used with reference to all the set appointed times of religious worship to Yahweh, which are Yahweh's appointed feast. Comparing Yeketzki 45, verse 17, and Hosea chapter 2, verse 11, we come to this understanding that Yahweh's new moons, as well as his Sabbaths, are also included in these feasts of Yahweh. The holy convocations during Yahweh's feasts are just as much Sabbath days as his weekly seventh day is a Sabbath, and Yahweh even calls these holy convocation days, Sabbath days, in Leviticus 23, verse 39. And it says, So beginning on the 15th day of the seventh moon, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, keep the feast of Yahweh for seven days. On the first day of the first of tabernacles, excuse me, on the first day of the feast of tabernacles, there shall be a Sabbath. And on the eighth day, the last great day, a Sabbath. If you account these for yourself, you will find that Yahweh has seven holy convocations, seven feast day Sabbath besides his weekly seventh day Sabbath upon which to honor him and have a holy gathering with others who love Yahweh and his laws. And here in the interpreter's dictionary of the Bible, uh, let's see, he tells us in the, uh, that at the center of the great uh, pilgrim feast, the feast when Yahweh's people gathered together to rejoice before him were the feast sacrifices. And so you see here it says, uh, I'm just going to read the underlined parts. Uh, the festal sacrifices eaten with great joy, the eating of meat, uh, relatively rare occurrence in ancient Israel. Well, anyway, 
it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense when you jump around like that on some of these. But I'm going to jump down to the bottom part. It says, Yahweh himself was assumed to participate symbolically by receiving the choice portions of fat which were burned on the altar. He also shared the wine through the libations that were offered at a later stage of the cultus. As has been emphasized in recent scholarship, the great feasts were occasions of covenant renewal at which uh, the bonds that held Israel together as the people of Yahweh were renit. Okay, so these are like renewals, you know, and we already know that when we come here, uh, like Yeshua's memorial, you know, what takes place. Okay, we already know what takes place. And all of these feasts, you know, when we, when we come before Father Yahweh, we're showing Father Yahweh that we want to continually be a part of what he has to offer. Okay, pastor had made mention in one of the older sermons, he says that, um, and he was talking about the mind and the heart. He says, we forget a lot of things. We forget a lot of things, but it's all in our subconscious minds. And one day we are going to be able to, you know, use all of that information at will. You know, he said that Yahweh's, uh, like, basically his subconscious mind is his conscious mind. Okay? It's his conscious mind. He doesn't, it's, not like, it's not a subconscious mind. It's his conscious mind. And one day our minds are going to be like that. But he said, but for right now... It has to be in our hearts. We have to want this. We have to desire this. And one of the ways to show Yahweh that we want these things in our heart is to read the information. You know, read the prophetic words, reading the newsletters, getting this information in our minds. Okay? Getting it in our minds. Okay? Changing our hearts and our minds. Okay? But our, our, our desire, the desire has to be there. It has to be there. We have to want to be like Yahweh. Okay, we have to want to be like Yahweh, okay? Because we're, we're going to disagree with each other from here to there on various issues, but there should be no disagreement when it comes to being like Yahweh, okay? There's only one way to achieve that, and that's through the keeping of Yahweh's laws, and everyone here, we should be in unity with that, okay? Now, we have personality differences. We have different things that we're still overcoming, which may cause some, some conflicts, but we should be able to push past that because we all have the same goal, no, I mean, do, are we clear on that? We all have the same goal. Praise Yahweh. Okay, everyone in the house of Yahweh, our goal is to, is to, uh, to become like Yahweh, to be in the kingdom of Yahweh, to work with each other forever. Okay, so we should be rejoicing as we watch each other overcome. You know, not looking to tear someone down because they're still falling short. You know, we see someone fall, we should be quick to throw a hand out there to help them up. Okay, and I'm not just talking about physically. You know, you see your brother stumbling, we should be a righteous example. We should be a pillar that they can use, you know, to help them get back up. You know, not looking to step on them or to step over them or to expose them, point out their flaws. You know, we all have counselors that's, that, that's supposed to be helping us. Okay, and we should be able to go to our counselors for help. Okay, but we need to learn how to work together in unity so that we can all be a part of Yahweh's kingdom. If not... You know, we're not like Yahweh, okay? Why? Because the will of Yahweh is what? That none, that none shall perish, okay? So remember what Yeshua said, if you, if you even desire your brother to fall away, are you worthy of the kingdom of Yahweh if you desire that your brother fall away? No. You know, if someone has sin in their life, you know, the priest will help them remove that sin from their life, okay? If they're willing, if they want to be like Yahweh. If not, you know, you know what you need to do. You know, what did Yeshua say to keep it? What business is it of yours? What I told Shaul to do, or not Shaul, but the other person. I can't remember who it was. It's no one's business between that person and their counselors. We have to mind our own business, okay? Let Yahweh work with us. Let Yahweh work with each individual, okay? We need to stop condemning each other, okay? We need to be, remember Yeshua said that the world will know that you belong to me because of what? The way that we condemn each other? Because of what? How we what? How we love one another. <laughs> How we love one another. Okay? And true love is what? Keeping Yahweh's law. But what's the, what's the phrase that I'm looking for? Well, actually, I said it backwards. I kind of gave you the answer. It's correction is. <laughs> so you probably wouldn't have got it because of the way that I said that. But correction through teachings and being corrected. Correcting what? Our behavior. The way that we think. Okay, because we're wrong. <laughs> we're wrong. Who's right? Right, when you, said, when you said, Pastor, you're right, Pastor, Yahweh, Yahshua, you know, it starts there. 
It starts there. So anyone who, any one of us that are, that's not in unity with what pastor is saying, we're 100% wrong. Okay, we didn't come here to change Yahweh's house. Some of us might think so, but it's not going to take place. We're not going to change Yahweh's house. We're here to change. We're here to grow in Yahweh's house as Yahweh's house is growing. And Yahweh's house is growing. Remember, there was a time when this wall wasn't here. <laughs> Some of y'all weren't even born back then. That's funny to say. I feel really, really ancient right now. <laughs> but the house of Yahweh is constantly growing, and Yahweh is allowing us to be here to grow with this great house. And there is growth. You know, and pastor's rejoicing in that as he looks out and said, you know, he'll say, you know, you're almost there. You're almost there. And we should praise Father Yahweh for giving us the time to continue to grow. Okay, and why am I on this rant? Because it's all based on the knowledge that comes from Father Yahweh. This is how we started off. You know, Yahweh's people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge and the rejection of knowledge. We can't reject the knowledge that's coming forth from Yahweh's house and hope to live. Okay. We can't, we can't think that, well, maybe I might just get lucky. I might just get in on luck. It doesn't work like that. It's a plan. It's a, it's a strategy. You know, Yahweh says, my words are not going to return to me unless they do exactly what I sent them to do. And that's to produce mankind. That's to make mankind in his likeness and in his image. We're going to be just like Yahweh when this is all said and done. Okay, imagine that. <laughs> can't even imagine it. I can't imagine what it's like to be like Yahweh, to be Yahweh. It's, it's, like, it's kind of like beyond my comprehension. But I'm going to continue reading here because I have a little bit. Wow. <laughs> oh, okay. Praise Yahweh. I'm on page 346. Okay. Therefore, it is during, during Yahweh's commanded times, during the feast which he has commanded in Leviticus chapter 23, that Yahweh's people now eat and drink at Yahweh's table. Just as the apostle Shaul spoke about it, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verse 21. And it's a uh, reading from the Encyclopedia Judaica. says, we find that Yahweh's feast sacrifices were offered to him in obedience to his will. And it says, the source of the festivals. In the pagan, religious, in the pagan religions of, ancient, of the ancient East, the festivals were established by man in order to find favor with the deity and prevent disasters. It was against this concept that the prophets, what's that, militated, militated sacrifices. And, that, and I, I looked that word up, and sometimes you, you could say, the, I could say the word a hundred times right at home, but when you get up here, it's awful. <laughs> but that word militate means to have weight or, or an effect. But uh, it says here that the biblical concept, on the other hand, is the, uh, is the exact antithesis. Y'all hear that? Antithesis. <laughs> For not only are the festivals commanded by Yahweh, but the service on these days as well. The festival sacrifices are not offered for any material reward, but in obedience to the to, to the command, because we know it's not divine, okay? It's not divine command. But that word antithesis means the exact opposite, okay? So here we saw that these festivals in the, in the ancient East were, were established by man to request favor from the gods, but from the biblical standpoint, these feasts were ordained by Yahweh. These are whose feasts? Yahweh. Yahweh's feasts, and we keep them in obedience to him. You know, remember what it says, uh, even, you know, like the Sabbath day in Hebrews chapter 4, you know, uh, the people entered into that rest because, uh, how, how does it read? You know I'm going to read it, right? Sometimes my mind will be going in a thousand different directions and then I can't pinpoint on the exact scripture, so I have to read it. Let's see. And then we'll close here. Therefore, since a promise of entering his rest remains, let us fear or let us reverence so that none of you should come short of it. Uh, and there, Let's see, verse 6. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. So we're doing these things out of obedience to the word of Yahweh because we know that, you know, if we're obedient to Yahweh, we're going to have life abundant. OK, we see that through disobedience to Yahweh. We see that it leads to sickness, disease, famines, earthquakes, uh, pestilence, disease, epidemics, wars, all of these different things we see because of disobedience. 
So we're going to be teaching obedience to Yahweh, and we're going to put an end to all of the suffering that we created from the very beginning. May Yahweh bless your understanding.